thank you guys for joining another episode of Lens. Um, my name is Tiffany Doe. I'm stepping in for Hector today. Uh, today's guest is Danielle Chen, a senior UX designer at UI Design Studio in Philadelphia, um, which is part of Ernest & Young LLP. Uh, she does user-centered research design um, al along with design and development, and it, she's based out of Philadelphia. Sorry, I'm tripping up. <laughs> but she's a co-founder and CEO at Rekindling, a community a community that connects people through engaging in meaningful, meaningful conversations on challenging topics. Prior to EY, she's worked at Hasbro and Penn Medicine, developing products ranging from electromechanical toys to diagnostic apps. She has a master's in integrated product design from the University of Pennsylvania and a bachelor's degree in product design from Drexel University. She's a passionate designer and very dedicated to projecting play into her work in the lives to bring joy to <laughs> in work to bring joy to people's lives um danielle, danielle i'm really excited to have you as part of our latin series today um i think you know we have had few ux designers featured on our platform and i think what you bring to the table from a user experience perspective is incredibly valuable because it kind of uses the everyday challenging topics into something that is more palatable for people who aren't used to talking about those things. So um, now that I've given your introduction, I'm happy to, yes, hand over the host role to you so you can present your deck. And let me know if this works. Sure, thanks Tiffany for the intro. Um, I lost you for a little bit. Um, I know, <laughs> sorry about the internet disruption. <laughs> Let's hope for the golden hour. Uh, yeah. All right, so let me start sharing my screen. <clears throat> Oops, not there. All right, let me know if it's coming through okay. Looks good to me. Okay, cool. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Danielle and today I'm really excited to take you onto a journey where I've rediscovered three of my superpowers my authenticity, my curiosity, and my resilience through play. But before I start, I would like all of you to think of three moments of your life where you felt external pressure to change, where you felt too embarrassed to ask the question why, because you're too afraid to be seen as someone who's not cool enough for the conversation. And also a moment where you felt like everything was going against you and there seems to be no way out. And I want you to remember these three moments throughout my presentation. <clears throat> In 2012, I came to the US from China to study product design at Drexel University. When I first came here, everything and everyone looked so different and diverse to me. So it didn't really occur to me that I was any different than others. But soon enough, <clears throat> I started to hear other people saying things like, you look so Chinese. You must be so good at math because you're from China. What are you eating? It smells and looks so weird. And stop speaking Chinese in front of us. You're in the US. <clears throat> at the time, I didn't really realize or understand what was going on until I talked to a friend of mine who is a first generation of Chinese American. And she told me what I was experiencing was the fact that I was being stereotyped and being racially discriminated by the others. <clears throat> As I looked at myself into the mirror, I thought to myself, that I must change in order to be accepted by the others more, in order to fit in a little more. So I started asking people to go shopping with me to replace my whole wardrobe so that I can look a little more Americanized. And whenever people ask me for a calculation, I will always tell them that, oh, I'm not good at math. And I will always pull on my calculator to prove to them. And a lot of times, whenever people ask me 
what I want to get for dinner, I would just tell them that I want to get pizza. Even though at the time I really wasn't a big fan of pizza at all. And I started to tell my Chinese friends that I can no longer hang out with them. But I didn't really tell them why. As I started to adopt these changes, I start to think that I think I'm starting to fit in finally. But obviously, that was not enough because a lot of times <clears throat> I always find myself fading out of a conversation whenever people start to make some cultural references. A lot of people ask me at the time if I was being disengaged and, or if I find these conversations not interesting enough. But I was too embarrassed to tell them that I just really didn't get any of the references that they were talking about. But slowly, I found a trick, a trick that worked pretty well at the time. I started to pick up the rhythm. So whenever people start laughing, I will start to laugh along, even though I didn't really get what was going on and what they were actually talking about. And it did seem like I was starting to fit in really well and people were starting to accept me more. Little, but also <clears throat> because I started to make assumptions about things. I suppressed myself from being curious and I stopped questioning things. And a lot of times I find myself lacking of creative ideas all the time. I remember vividly when we were working on a project in our junior year, it was actually a toy project, which was supposed to be, be really fun. But to me, it was actually a really, really horrible semester because I constantly find myself not being able to come up with any good ideas. And that was also a time <clears throat> when all of us started to look for internship op opportunities for the rest of our junior year. And I started to ask myself, what am I really good at? What am I interested in doing? Would anyone want to hire me? As I was struggling to find a job that I really want or to even find a job that wants me, one of my classmates came to me one day and asked if I were interested in talking to a design director from Hasbro <clears throat> because, because she decided to move forward with a different offer and decline the offer that was extended to her from Hasbro. I said, sure, why not? As I got onto the phone with the design director, she simply asked me a little bit about my background, where I came from, and things like that. <clears throat> a few minutes after she hung up, she extended an offer to me, which was shocking to me at the time because I just really didn't know what about me that really attracted her. And it was a little after I started working there for my internship I realized that the main reason why they hired me was because the big project that they wanted me to work on for the summer was about a market research for the Chinese toy industry. At the end of my internship, after I gave my presentation to multiple teams across Hasbro about that research, a lot of them came to me and said to me that they really appreciate me providing them with a really different and authentic perspective. And also, at the end of my internship, <clears throat> I had a conversation with my boss and my mentor. And she said to me, you should really embrace your identity and take advantage of your cultural background. At the time, I didn't really understand what she meant by it. But I kept thinking about what she said to me as I started to brainstorm for my senior design. As I reflected on my experience for the past three years in my college, I realized what I was experiencing was not uncommon. 
And in fact, it happened to a lot of American born Chinese or the first generation of Chinese American in this country. Because a lot of times we were struggling to fit in to the American culture or trying to figure out what we want to do with our Chinese heritage or our Chinese background. And as I dug into second research even more, <clears throat> I realized what I was experiencing was some sort of identity crisis, even though mine happened a little later than most people. As I started to narrow down my focus, I've come to the realization that I really want to work on something that's close to my heart and to help this group of people who I, who I identify with to really help make a change in their life. <clears throat> so I decided to focus on the American born Chinese children as my target audience. So I started talking to a lot of them to learn about their experience in learning about Chinese culture, their ways of connecting to their family, in what aspect of Chinese culture they're mostly interested in, and in what way would, them, would they like to learn about Chinese culture. And I found some common patterns after I talked to 30 plus of American born Chinese. And I found that most American born Chinese children prefer to learn about the Chinese culture in context. And a lot of them mentioned that food is the main way for them to connect with your family. And a lot of them have told me that they're eager to learn more about the history aspect of the Chinese culture, but they have yet to find an engaging way for them to do so. So as I brainstorm a little bit more, I came up with this design direction that I decided to move forward with, <clears throat> which is to create an engaging learning experience that connects American born Chinese children with their family, that educates them about the Chinese culture through the lens of food, as well as letting them explore the Chinese history and its impact to the rest of the world. So what I ended up creating was this product called the Chinese Learning Launchbox. It's a monthly subscription service that will deliver fresh ingredients to your door. And each month, you will get a type of food that not only has a very significant impact in the Chinese culture, but also to the rest of the world. Through making the food, you're encouraged to make the food with your parents so that you can have some conversations and and in this way, you get to connect with your family, especially your parents and your grandparents, a little more. And after you've made the food and tasted it, you get to get onto this learning app that will teach you about how this food was originated in the Chinese history and how it expands to the rest of, the China, to the rest of China to different regions of China and adapt to different versions based on different geography and customs. <clears throat> and you also get to learn about how dumplings have traveled throughout the world through trading or other historical con uh, events. And in this way, not only they get to connect with their family, but they really get to appreciate a Chinese culture even more. And of course, I brought a lot of dumplings to my senior show when I was presenting my senior project. I was really proud of this project, not only because I got really, really great feedback about what I ended up doing, but more importantly, I felt a sense of pride by reconnecting to my Chinese heritage. And finally, I was able to feel like myself again. A little after I graduated from college, I was able to return back to Hasbro for my very first full-time job. But this time, at a different group, called For Real. <clears throat> For Real is a line of toys that are animatronic toys with plush skin on top. You might not be able to see 
how complex these toys are, but they really are because every single toy involves a large group of people, including mechanical and electrical engineers, sound designers, product designers, graphic designers, pattern makers, sculptors, and the list goes on. And because I was the least experienced designer on the team, I was put on to be in charge of the least complicated toys, which was understandable. But soon enough, I realized that I wasn't getting enough out of this experience. <clears throat> and I knew that I wasn't able to get or the answers or to know, to learn about how these toys were made through working on them. So I started to find other ways around. One day, I saw this kid, this little bit kid from a coworker of mine, and I asked to borrow it so that I can start messing with those little bits to get a first taste of what coding feels like, how I can make those interactions that I'm seeing from those complicated toys to happen. But I knew that wasn't enough, and I knew that I wanted to take a more systematic approach on programming. <clears throat> And at a time, I was also facing some really challenging visa issues. So I decided to apply and join the Integrated Product Design Master's Program. And funnily enough, the very first project that I got to work on prior to me starting my first semester of my master's program was to build my own robot. During those four weeks, that's what my desk constantly looked like. Partially because I was really disorganized and I was really terrible at coding, but also I was so eager to learn more and more about coding. And I didn't mind that I didn't mind spending a lot of time on discovering what else I can do with programming? What else, what other interactions that I can do with those lines of code? And I made an ambitious goal that no one thought I was able to make it. But by the end of the fourth week, I made my very first robot, Daisy the Dinobot. She's very expressive. She walks towards strangers, but will slow down as you get closer to her. But as soon as she finds out that you're friendly enough, she will start to approach you once again and give you the best smiles that you can ever ask for. And obviously, her horn lights up in different colors based on her mood. After this, I started to get more and more ambitious because I just really wanted to know what else, what more I can do with coding. I started to big build more robots, like this little guy called Edie who will give you lots of shit if you feed him with vegetables like broccoli, but will fall in love with you if you ended up giving him some ice cream after he accepted some sort of vegetables. I also built a submarine with a team that's connected to three game consoles that indicates the winning or losing state of the game. It will blow bubbles on you either in an aggressive way or in a friendly way based on <coughs> your losing or winning state. And it also plays some really interesting sound effect, again, based on whether you've lost or won the game. This project might seem really fun to you, and they were. But more importantly to me, I realized as I started to build more robots, as I started to pick up more programming languages, I started to ask more and more whys. I started to find that piece of me that's being shadowed for so long, that curiosity inside of me have, has always been there, but I was just too embarrassed to show that to others. But now I'm starting to pick it up. Which leads to my next question that I asked myself at the time. <coughs> Is building robots all I want to do? Again, I didn't have the answer 
at the time to this question, but I knew it wasn't gonna be yes. And luckily, I had an experience to work at Penn Medicine between my first and second year of my master's. One of the projects that I was in charge of doing was this app that's paired with an animatronic toy that will help make the assessment of cerebral palsy much more accessible, much more convenient, accurate, and more friendly so that the parents can do that themselves at home for their newborns. During this experience, I felt very much empowered because I realized I was able to apply my skills to make a much more positive impact in people's lives. As I returned to my master's program after my time ended with Penn Medicine, <coughs> I started to brainstorm what I wanted to work on for my second year final project. As I started to talk to two other people, we realized that each one of us have had some sort of experience with cancer. And as we dug into secondary research even more, we realized that cancer has made a huge impact in people's lives. As of 2019, about 18 million new cases occurred, which caused about 9 million deaths. So we decided to focus on the families who have been affected by cancer as our target audience. We started to interview with families who have been affected by cancer, as well as experts who have worked with cancer patients. We also went to some cancer support groups to find out what kind of activities they do there and what kind of conversation they are having there. We also read a lot about people's stories of their cancer experience. So talking to these people and also reading about people's stories, we have found these three common patterns. A lot of families mentioned that once they've entered this world of cancer, they find their communication is very much lacking. And even if it exists, there's often no structure to it. The information usually gets filtered from parents to the kids which could cause more confusion and frustration in the family. And lastly, happiness usually becomes a secondary thing. And a lot of family bonding activities that used to have, that they used to have no longer exist. So as we brainstormed, we came up with these three design criteria that we really wanted to include in our final product. <coughs> we thought that the product must offer opportunities for regularly scheduled conversations. It must encourage each family member to share their perspective in an honest way. And it must provide an engaging experience to physically unite families. And we thought, how might we create a productive and fun user experience for fostering difficult conversations? And I'm about to skip a thousand slides because we did tremendous amount of ideation and prototyping. And what we ended up creating was this board game called Rekindling. It consists of prompt cards with questions ranging from lighthearted to thought provoking to cancer related. Each family member is encouraged to answer to the question and share their answer with one another. And in this way, each family member gets to build more empathy and understanding towards one another. By the end of the game, they will get to collectively build an abstract structure together, which helps document their conversations and carry forward their experience. So the next time they see the structure in their house, they will get reminded to play the game again and have some more conversations with each other. <coughs> After we concluded this project, our team wasn't quite sure how and if we want to move forward with this project. A few days after we concluded the project, I, my parents came to visit me for my master's graduation. 
and that's when I found out that my mom was diagnosed with cancer. The summer I started working on this project. That night, I couldn't fall asleep. It just seemed too ironic to me that I worked on a project this whole year while not knowing that my mom was affected by cancer. And for a while, this project became really painful to me to even think about. But slowly, I realized this isn't about me. This is about me trying to turn pain into, turn my pain into some motivation to help more families like mine to navigate through a difficult situation like this. And because of that, I decided to pick up this project and form the new team. And I included a social worker and psychologist to help enhance the materials of the game. And also I created a downloadable version of the game so that it can be distributed among different facilities to conduct more testing and gather more feedback from the patients. And things were starting to look great. And I even scheduled some game nights with some facilities in Philadelphia. <coughs> but then COVID came and everything I have previously scheduled and planned have all had to be canceled or postponed. But I knew I couldn't just let it, like COVID, destroy my game or let, me st let it stop me from working on this game. And I started to think and brainstorm ideas around how to make this game come to life, but in a different format. I was inspired to create a virtual version of the game, which ironically has gotten much more positive feedback from a lot of people as I started to facilitate some conversations with them because it's actually much more accessible. And I was able to connect with a lot of people who I wasn't able to connect with due to distance before. But now, since everything goes virtual, we no longer have any of the excuses. But a little after that, the murder of George Floyd happened and it really broke my heart because as a person of color, as a minority, as a foreigner in this country, I've experienced a lot of racial discrimination and injustice. And I simply just couldn't sit with this piece of news. So I started to think, how can I make a contribution to social justice in my own way? I decided after a lot of brainstorming again, I decided to team up with experts from different areas of topic and created versions of rekindling in other topics like race, gender, and COVID in the hope of having people to start to have more conversations about these societal issues that we're facing. Things were starting to look great again, and I was actually really excited about all the plans that I had for the rest of the year and for next year. Then I got this piece of message from an immigration lawyer after my H-1B work visa was approved. She said to me, you must dissolve your rekindling LLC or stop working on this game once you've transitioned to your work visa, your H-1B work visa in October. So what she was telling me was that basically in a few months, I am no longer able to work on this game anymore. This time, I really had to lay down on my floor because it really felt like someone just took away this child that I gave birth to and I wasn't able to fight back. I was devastated because I pretty much devoted every single second of my free time to developing this game. 
but now I just don't know what to do with it. But many nights as I lay down on the floor, because that's how I cope with this kind of news now, I was trying to figure out what exactly it was that I was trying to achieve out of this game and what I really enjoyed working on this game. And I start to realize through facilitating all these conversations with people on a variety of topics, what I really enjoyed about doing those things was that I was able to connect with people from a variety of backgrounds. And it really lets me practice my facilitation skills and really gain some different perspectives and become aware of some of the societal changes, uh, challenges. So I start to think, what else can I do to carry forward what I've learned and enjoyed about working on rekindling without causing any legal trouble and also maybe in a different format? Which led to this new idea that I'm really excited to roll out with my best friend, a, a podcast called The Hot Pot, where we share all the pieces of ourselves and celebrate each other. And in case you don't know what Hot Pot is, it's a meal that gathers a group of people together to cook up a variety of ingredients in the boiling pot. The broth gets richer and richer once you add more ingredients to it. And this podcast was born out of the hope to celebrate a society where we can exist independently, that we can celebrate our individual characteristics and build a much more diverse and richer environment. So play has led me through a journey of rediscovery and strengthening some of the superpowers that I've always held, including authenticity, curiosity, and resilience. And now, I would like all of you to leave this presentation with this question. How might you use play to discover or rediscover something about yourself? Because if you think about it, when we were little, we were never shy away from showing others who we really are. And we are always the one that's asking the why to our parents and to others. And also, if you remember the first time you finally learned how to ride your bike or roller skate after many times of falling to the ground, that joy that you had. And I would like you to practice that and to think about those moments and how you can strengthen them or rediscover that piece of yourself. I'm Danielle and thank you. That was great. Thank you. I don't know how to stop sharing. I can't find no, my mouth. I think it's gonna be up in the top. Okay. Right -hand corner. I'll share. There you are. We're at the very top of the screen. There's this green bar. Okay. I think. And then you say stop sharing. Okay. I think I, s oh wait, there. All right, cool. Um, well, I have a few questions. Um, if anyone okay. else has questions, um, please put them within the Q&A and I'll go through them as we get them. Um, but one thing that struck me about you and your, I guess, identity as a designer, you tend to take your own personal experiences and instill them within your work. Um, I guess my question is how challenging is that for you to do um to take those personal experiences and mm -hmm. kind of translate it into something Your screen froze. oh shoot <laughs> am I, I, don't, I think i missed five seconds of what you were saying okay sorry again about my network um can you see me and hear me yep <laughs> okay i guess the question was um how challenging is it for you to take your own like very intimate personal experiences and distill it to something that can be offered to a larger audience? Because I guess the goal of a designer is to mass produce things for other people to utilize. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I think um, 
So I kind of alluded to it a little bit. So when I was brainstorming for my uh, senior design, um, or at, when I was at Drexel, um, I knew that I wanted to do something that's close to my heart, but at the same time will be able to resonate with a large group of people who has experienced similar situations like mine. And so I, at the time I was reflecting a lot on a lot of conversation and my relationship with a lot of the American born Chinese um, friends that I had. And I realized that the reason why I was able to bond with them so quickly over a lot of the, like a lot of the topics at the time about like identity and stuff like this was because of this common thread that we shared. And that kind of prompted me to think that what I'm going to design, this is not just gonna be about me, but rather it's gonna offer some positivity or it will be able to help a larger group of people. But the reason why I want to come from a personal perspective is because I wanted to make this experience as authentic as possible that can truly resonate with others. Um, so yeah, I think my advice is obviously you can't just be designing for yourself, but when you start to think about some of your personal experience, start to think about how it might also resonate with others, which is also you know, kind of the hope that I have for this podcast, which is through sharing my experience as a minority living in this country or a foreigner living in this country, that I will be able to connect with people who might have also experienced things where they had felt they weren't accepted by the society or they felt discriminated against um, based on a stereotype. That's awesome. Um, I guess with, um, you know, your background between, oh no, I think I'm frozen again. Oh, between your undergraduate education and your master's, um, what would you say each experience offered to you as an individual? Like, what did you learn within your era for undergrad and what did you learn in your era as a master's degree? See, I've been thinking about this a lot recently because I, yeah, I think the, um, what I really appreciate about my experience at Drexel was that I learned a lot of hard skills. Um, like I learned a lot about sketching and woodworking, pr prototyping, but then I realized it wasn't just about the hard skills um, because now whenever I'm trying to make sense of a, uh, a an idea to others um, in the most, in the quickest way, I will always be able to find a way to communicate that with others because I have all, a variety of skills that I've gained from my undergrad experience. Um, but, you know, I think even though I didn't really choose to uh, pursue a master's degree. I mean, I always wanted to get a master's, but I didn't know if I was going to get it this soon. But obviously, my visa wouldn't allow me to um, you know, work longer at Hasbro. So, um, but I was really, really grateful for my experience at IPD, my master's uh, program, because I, I think one thing that I really enjoy was this collaborative um, environment because for IPD, I don't remember if I explained, but we, uh, the reason why we're called integrated product design was because a, we have students coming from all sorts of different backgrounds. So uh, especially in design, engineering, and business. Um, so every project we do, ex except for the very first project that we did was individual, but everything else was collaborative. And it was almost like mimicking the real world, uh, real work environment, um, because I constantly have to communicate with others who might have not come from a design background. Um, but they were also able to teach me about like other skills and other perspectives. Um, but I think also, um, it really forced me to think more about what I want to do with design. Like what can I really utilize my skills to help make a bigger and more positive impact on people's life? I see. Um, yeah, I think, you know, 
a lot of students who end up completing their undergraduate degree in design um, when it comes to like what's the next step as mm -hmm. far as their educational background goes um, there's always that debate do I go back to school and get a master's degree or should I go and work for a few years and is that good enough as far as like um, I guess advancing yourself mm -hmm. um, I guess you know I hope I'm, try I'm trying to like lead into the next question as gracefully as I can but um, with your master's degree and your master's project, um, yeah. how would you say that that roadmap um, transitioned for you? Like, what was your thought process about, you know, starting your own business from, you know, your master's thesis? What was your, you know, overall experience? What challenges did you face? Um, and where are you at currently with the whole COVID situation? I know you have this like hot pot, um, you know, <laughs> this podcast that you have planned and like you're going after um but it seems like there's so many external forces that are also affecting your decision making um how do you possibly you know stay happy and <laughs> like I don't know it, it seems like for anyone else um who doesn't have an immigrant background or like they don't or they aren't faced with these challenges um it could be incredibly overwhelming so how do you stay afloat while also staying like yeah agile? It definitely was challenging to me, and I think, um, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I two of the illustrations that I shared in my presentation, I it was, I had a few really tough weeks, um, but I knew that as a designer, as a creative, I, and as someone who, I think, I, I mentioned this in my presentation too, play has really taught me to become, resilient and to tell me that I can never give up um, because of due to any external factors um, because I think mean, I mean I think there's always ways to bring something that you're passionate about to life um, if you believe in it strongly and for me um, I knew that like as a designer obviously in my full-time job I like every day I'm dealing with design challenges, but I think that has also helped me to become more creative about my life decisions and how I can uh, make sense of things and also try to shift things around so that I can, I don't know, just bring things that I really care about uh, to come to life. And that's kind of how, you know, this whole journey of rekindling has, really taught me to never give up um, and always try to find a way to be creative about it. Yeah, I also feel that designers have a nature of, you know, um, wanting to always serve the underserved. Um, yeah. And would you say that is very ingrained in what you want to do with your career moving forward? Oh, sorry, that was a question. Oh, I guess so. I guess it was a question. <laughs> sorry, I'm not great at this interviewing thing. Um, but like, I don't know, it's, there's so much happening in the news these days. Um, is it, is it difficult to stay positive, you know, at times? Um, yeah. And I know, like, you were always, you just mentioned, like, how, like, because of your, um, you know, relationship with play and, um, how that always drives you to try to remain positive how how does this really navigate you down the road like how do you know how to instill um positive vibes into something that is not really that great of a situation i know you've seen it with like rekindling and the initial project with um families facing cancer how exactly mm -hmm. can, i guess how do you plan to integrate that with some of the racial tensions that have been going on and also um the COVID situation in general? Uh, I think, um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely not easy for me. Um, and I do see myself as someone who's extremely positive and optimistic, but I also get beaten up pretty easily. <laughs> um, I'm going to be uh, quite honest with that. But um, I know that there are things that we just can't really be in control of. Um, so I tend not to spend time and energy on things like that, but rather I try to seek for ways to 
one helped me I mean when it comes to like racial uh, injustice and all the news that's been flowing around I first I think what I've been doing is to uh, raise awareness to people but in a I guess in a more approachable way so like I I've also been following happy data from Georgia Lupi for a long time and I really like the way she kind of displays all the information to people a lot of the really heavy data but she used graphic to really break it down so that people can make sense of all the data and also be able to connect be, stay connected to the news and that's what I'm hoping to do um, as a designer and as someone who's deeply passionate about you know your social justice um, so I'm hoping one through the podcast but also through like me starting to become more active and vocal vocal about all these societal issues that I can use my design skills to bring some more light to those things um, but make it approachable for people to understand and resonate with um, I hope that answer your question no, I think definitely <laughs> I feel like my question was very drawn out. So that was like a perfect answer. Okay. Cool. Um, we did get a question from Design by Gemma. Um, do you develop these personal projects to enrich your portfolio to show to enterprises or do you develop them to improve yourself as a freelance designer? Let me read it again. Um, oh, so these most of these projects, um, I guess that I mentioned um, are from my schools, but I really hope that one day I'll be able to bring them to life um, once my life is not as complicated or constrained by, you know, the immigration laws. Um, but I started to um, work on some side projects, just really not for any purpose, but just wanted to connect with people and to share my ideas with others. Um, and I guess I I kind of stopped thinking about working on project as a way to enrich my portfolio because if you I believe that if, when you're doing good work, you will always be able to be spotted by someone um, because if you really believe in yourself and you know that you're doing something good to the society, um, I think that's much more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? That's, that's more satisfying and uh, more gravitating than just for the sake of bringing more pieces to your portfolio. Right. Um, Anonymous asks, do you see yourself ever going back to China or moving to any other country? Um, so yeah, actually that's also a question that I've been thinking a lot. Um, so, Short answer to the first half of the question is no, I don't want to go back to China for a lot of reasons. Um, because um, I also, your screen froze. I don't know if, I'm not talking can you still anything. hear me? Yes, <laughs> I see your hands. Okay, um, yeah, so I don't see myself going back home um, as much as I miss my parents and my the rest of my family there, but I think, um, I mean, there are things that I can't really talk about, but I don't see myself developing my career the same way as I have been uh, in this country. And, you know, I have come a really long way. Like I've been here for eight years and I really don't want to just give up like this. And even though right now <laughs> it is a really shitty situation, um, I mean, especially for uh, a Chinese foreigner in this country, um, but I am trying to take it as a silver lining where um, this is an opportunity for me to see some of the ugly sides of this society, this country. Um, but, and if I end up staying in this country, I do want to bring or contribute to uh, a lot of the issues that people are usually um, underseeing or they're not really noticing or, um, I don't know. I think, yeah, it, it's a tough question because I really don't know what's going to happen in a few years. Um, but I do think that I might be open to moving to other countries um, based on opportunities. But right now, it's just kind of hard to, to answer. 
but for now, yeah. I do want to stay here. I think we want to keep you too. <laughs> it's it's a hard, harsh reality we kind of live in these days. Um, I did have a question that kind of you know crossed my mind during the like the first half of your presentation about how you tried to Americanize yourself um, yeah. once you started realizing okay there are people who aren't familiar with Chinese culture, food, etc. Um, and I think anyone who kind of has like first gen background can relate to that definitely. Um, and you know, with my own personal feelings, like I, I remember doing that as a kid and not necessarily being happy with myself, mm -hmm. regardless of whether or not anyone else was kind of being more accepting. Yeah. Um, and did you feel similarly, which is really what propelled you to um, make to make this project where people can start embracing their own culture alongside other people? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the reasons why I was really bummed that I wasn't able to care for with this project, um, again, there was a lot of complications. Um, but I, yeah, I, I talked to a lot of people after this project was concluded and I started to think, I started to realize that this project has a lot of possibilities um, because not only um, people have expressed their interest in um, getting a sub a subscribing to this this product, even though they're not of they're not someone of Chinese descent, but they're just simply curious to learn more about the Chinese culture because it is a really fun and engaging way. But also a lot of people, again, like uh, people who are first generations of um, other ethnicities or nationalities, they've also expressed interest in developing their own versions of this learning lunchbox. So yeah, that's why I'm really hoping that one day where maybe someone can carry forward this idea and bring it to life so that more people can be benefited by it. Oh, I guess one thing I do wanna mention um, as a piece of advice, um, I think one thing that I've really learned from studying at my master's, because we do add in the business aspect uh, into any of the project that we work on, that I start to think about design or pro product design, not only from a design perspective, but also from a business strategy approach, how, so, such that how can we make a product more sustainable and scalable? And I think that has kind of become something that's ingrained uh, in my blood and way of thinking. So every time I think of an idea, I will always ask myself, can this be expanded to serve a larger audience? Which is to kind of answer your first question. Um, but yeah. Awesome. Um, that's really interesting. You should, should mention that, like the different things that are taught within like a business or master's program. Um, uh, I had a really good question about like the difference between industrial design and user experience design. And um, so I don't know, I don't know like if this will make sense when it comes out of my mouth, but <laughs> user experience to me ties back to the general like end to end experience of a person using a service or a product. Um, a lot of designers feel that UX is just screens and interfaces. <laughs> what do you think about that? <laughs> so much to say about this. Um, and I don't know if I will be able to um, accurately. I know, we got like yeah. seven minutes left or something like that in this talk. So, I mean, this is a pretty loaded topic too. Yeah. Um, but I think, um, you know, absolutely, obviously, um, I didn't really mention my transition from you know physical product design to digital product design but that was a pretty big shift for me and i also struggle with it quite a lot um i mean i will first talk a little bit about um, my experience at hasbro and how i tie my experience there to ux design uh, so a lot of people i do i i i am aware <laughs> that a lot of people only think of ux design um as you know digital or screen design but Personally, as someone who comes from a physical product design background, um, I actually think that a lot of things that I've worked on um, 
I mean, either in my undergrad or master's or at Hasbro, what actually related to UX design. For example, um, some of the toys we've designed, I mean, all the toys that we've designed, had, um, they all have some mechanical movement um, and also different sorts of interaction based on your like hand gesture or like sound effects. Or if you click at, uh, at, at the toy, they might do something to you to react to you. Um, and it plays back some sort of sound effect as well. And these are all user experience because if you think about it, these interactions, they have to be designed uh, and they can't just come out of nowhere and they have to fit they have to yeah i guess they have to work with the the physical design as well so for me i that's also a topic that i'm really interested in um which is how to bridge the gap between industrial design and ux design because it it really is the same thing if you think about the the process that goes behind um either a screen design or a um a physical product design um yeah and i think you know when I, whenever I talk about rekindling the game, um, I always tell people that, yeah, it is a physical product, but if you think about how we've designed the game structure um, and how we, like even like the format of the game, it being, I mean, it's not really round, but it being um, like a full shape is to really bring people together, even though mm -hmm. it is in a physical sense, but that interaction has to be, carefully curated. Um, so that's how I will put it. And hopefully these examples make sense. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I guess I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, design school, because you, you've gone through your product design undergrad and your master's. Um, what do you wish they were teaching more of um, in school? Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of things, <laughs> but I think one thing that I would mention, even though you know I, I do appreciate the fact that um, my master's included the business aspect um, into most of the project that we worked on, but I feel like it wasn't enough. And I think um, because usually the project ends um, when the class ends, but a lot of times students do have the passion to carry forward with the project so that they can maybe make a business out of it, uh, start their own companies. Um, but we, I don't think we were given a lot, a lot of opportunities to do so most of the time, um, partially because of the time constraint, but partially because of the resources that we had. Um, it wasn't enough and we didn't have enough mentorship on that like I think that's one thing that I really wish that um, I was taught more of and also another thing um, I really want to mention is that you know we had a lot of group projects um, both in my undergrad experience and also my master's but group project is not easy <laughs> and I think people know that and and that's something that you can't avoid when you enter the professional world. And I think I was lucky that I have had some good uh, group project experience, but there were still a lot of like frictions and tensions that I just didn't quite know how to resolve. Um, yeah, so I think I was hoping that there was more mentorship on that um, or maybe I think maybe it's not really on the professors anymore uh, because they're, I mean, I think most of them do have some professional experience, but if we were to have some sort of mentorship with people from the industry, like I would be more than happy to get my advice to the students um, mm -hmm. if they're struggling with their group project, because gosh, I had a lot of struggles with that as well. <laughs> but yeah, I, that's like the two things I can think of right now, but obviously I think there's definitely more. That. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're almost out of time. Um, trying to think of a fun question to end on. <laughs> I guess what's next? Um, yeah. What's next for you? What do you Where do you see yourself in the next couple of years? And where do you hope to see the state of the country for that matter? <laughs> 
don't know how to answer, but I do think that in November we'll get to see some changes um, because there's just too much suffering right now. And I personally see myself um, doing more work that's not just about design, but more so I want to be, bring in more uh, voices about some of the societal challenges that they were fa that we're facing, um, and integrate that into my my creative work. I'm not gonna call it design because I do think like podcast writing these are all creative work, uh, even though they're not necessarily design. Um, but as a creative, I'm always looking for um, different and more ways to expand myself, expand my skills, and also to connect with more people. Um, and I'm really hoping, <laughs> that's one thing I, I was debating whether to include in my presentation or not, but I, I mentioned this to you, Tiffany, that I mm -hmm. was offered to teach a class that's exact, that's in the same topic of my presentation, which is design and play. And I, I've worked, I started working on it without realizing that, you know, I actually wasn't able to do so because of my yeah. training. And it was a pretty shitty thing for me because I mean, obviously it was a pretty good recognition for me uh, to be offered to teach a class, but at the same time, I guess more, more so I was so excited to kind of pass down my knowledge and my experience and my expertise to um, some aspiring designer, uh, design students. Um, so I'm trying to figure out, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure out a way to, um, to teach this class in some sort of format and be able to connect with design students because that's something I'm also really passionate about to educate uh, young designers um, and yeah I, I mean just connect with them because I, I think the, the, the most thing we need right now during COVID is more human connection so I'm also brainstorming a lot of different ways to you know connect with others um, in a virtual format um, mm -hmm. but yeah I think I but all in all, I wanted to be more vocal um, and I want to help uh, more people to connect with each other um, and also to help bring more positivity uh, to the society that we live in. So, that right. well, I think you're definitely excelling at that. Um, I guess following your feed in the last couple of weeks. I am really proud to know you as a designer and as a friend. Um, and we're happy to have you on Lens and I'm sure Advanced Design, you know, with our platform and message, we'd be happy to welcome you back in whatever method we can find. So yeah, um, yeah I guess, you know, this is Lens and this is Danielle Chen. Give her a follow on Instagram and we'll, um, I guess, hopefully get in touch again pretty soon. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tiffany. And thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, All right guys. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye.